I think it's important that my story is told to people because there are a lot of gay athletes out there. Who here has used homophobic language? Yeah, there we go. That's what I expected. I was so racked with anxiety and depression. I stopped eating, I kind of stopped sleeping. For me, the darkness entailed a lot of self-abuse. When it came out, all things changed. How so? Well, he's not playing soccer anymore. Cut down, crossover. We really don't train young athletes to put themselves in other people's shoes, to say, this is what it's like for your teammate when you're being homophobic. In Sochi, there was only five of us that came out. To any kid that needed to hear that message, I had hoped or I was optimistic that they heard it. Social change makers. My name is Justin Douglas, and today we'll be in conversation with four extremely talented Canadians, all part of the documentary film Standing on the Line. Standing on the Line is a Canadian documentary that explores homophobia in professional sports. Directed by Paul Emile Dancremont and produced by the Canadian Film Board, the documentary is now available on CBC Gem. So, joining me today, we have the director of the film. Paul Emile Dancremont, and the three main subjects of the documentary, Anastasia Busey, Busis, speed skater, David Testo, soccer player, and Brock McGillis, hockey player. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having okay, us. Okay, so to get this started, Paul, uh, where did the idea come about to do this documentary and why did you feel it was important? Well, um, I'm not contrary to the fine people in this uh, Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an athlete, but I am gay. And uh, I did, um, and this, like, my sexual identity has basically, is very important for me, and uh, it has shaped who I am, really, and the struggles that I've gone through. So, um, in 2012, I did a documentary about um, uh, asylum, a gay and lesbian asylum seekers uh, coming to Canada to seek refuge. So it was kind of like looking at homophobia in the world, outside of Canada, coming to Canada as a safe refuge. And then I, I wanted to kind of explore Canada more, you know, like where, where does homophobia exist? what are the places that maybe we could start thinking about changing? And that uh, reflection brought me to sports. So that's how I got to, to sports. And there's a little personal thing that I haven't talked about a lot, but you know, when you're a kid growing up and you get bullied for being gay, which happened to me, who are the bullies? Well, typically they're jocks. Typically they're like the athletes, you know? So there was a little bit of maybe revenge in my, uh... <laughs> but no, but making peace with it, you know, making peace with it when it, it has personally done that. And how did you go about finding the participants? How did you land on the athletes you landed on? Well, yeah, that was not easy, but, um, <laughs> um, in the case uh, of uh, Anastasia and David, um, they had already come out publicly. So, um, I, so that's, I went that route. I mean, in the case of, of David, what I found interesting, and I mean, David, you can correct me if I don't get your story right, but um, David came out publicly on Radio Canada in 2011. And after that, he didn't do a lot of media. Um, and that kind of made me go, hmm, I wonder what's going on with that soccer player, you know? <laughs> and then when I met with him and found out what was going on, I said, well, this is a rich story that I hope David will agree to tell. Um, so that's that part. And then while I was filming, I think I had started to film uh, Brock came out publicly and I immediately contacted Brock and uh, flew to Sudbury to meet with him and uh, yeah that's how that's how I got these fine people and there were other people also that I 
you know, there are other aspects that I was trying to get, you know, when you're doing research, you cast a wide net. Um, and uh, for example, um, I tried to get Michael Sam to agree to be in this documentary. I traveled to uh, New York City to meet with one of his close friends. Um, I did a lot, <laughs> sent uh, several emails to his personal email account. Didn't work out, but that's documentary, you know, you try. And for all the athletes, uh, when Paul approached you, what were your thoughts? Am I, am I gonna do this documentary? Were there any trepidations about signing up for it? Uh, Anastasia, let's start with you. We had like the nicest little afternoon. You took me for a tea and a scone, I think. And I was living in Montreal and you had mentioned David. Brock was still, uh, this was like a long time ago. This feels like a little bit like a different life. Yeah. Um, and we just had a good conversation. I mean, like two or three hours, I think the time just went by and I just appreciated your, I mean, I guess it sounds kind of cliched, attention to detail, but I just, really respected and was so honored that you came to me and had right off the bat just like the best questions and so I mean I was very confident that I would say yes to begin with and within seven and a half minutes I was like yeah like I just love your energy and um, really appreciated the work that you'd put in already before you'd even met me. David. Uh... I will first say hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was uh, approached by Paul and uh, really interested in his idea and his, um, his desire to bring this to the forefront of the conversation that we're having today. Um, so I, I, and no one else had kind of ventured in that direction yet, at least that I knew of or heard of. Uh, so I was definitely more than willing um, to do this, but uh, also because of Paul's vision was so clear and uh, you could tell that he had done his homework. So it, I felt comfortable uh, and assured that you were going to represent uh, everyone in the film in their highest light. So I, I found that that was really important because these stories are very powerful. And uh, I don't know if any of you guys have kind of felt the ripple effects within your own families or in your own communities, but um, what what is in this film, um, I think is, is very personal to all of us. So thank you, Paul, for sharing it in such a beautiful way. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you, Brock. Yeah, so by the time I came out, and I think, um, when, when did you start filming? Was it 2014, 2015? Yeah, 14 or 15. Uh, and because it was right after Sochi, right? When was Sochi? 2014. Okay, so it was right after that? Um, I think it was or about before. a year after that. I started okay. filming at the, the, the high school in New Brunswick. That was so, and I like, didn't come out until late 2016 and then we didn't connect until 2017 right and um you were like pretty far down the line at that point yeah uh standing on the line down the line um haha um, so anastasia quote <laughs> yes so for me it was um and i was getting bombarded at that point because my story had just come out and I'm like, who is this guy? What does he want? It's another like interview. What is this? And then you're like, can I come to Sudbury and meet with you? And, and I was like, yeah, sure. Let's do it. And then you flew to Sudbury and we, we uh, it was during the Cinefest Film Festival and we yeah. spent the weekend uh, getting to know each other. I really appreciated who you were, who you are as a person, first and foremost. And it eased my fear of somebody telling my story. Um, I, I've always wanted to be in, uh, I'm, I'm a control freak and always want to be in control of how my story is told. And, and to relinquish that, especially so early on in my coming out process was, you know, I was pretty apprehensive at first, but after spending the weekend and then I, 
knew who Anastasia was, and I actually lived in Montreal when David came out. Um, so hearing that they were in the film was, you know, to me, like David was one of the first people I saw come out publicly as a male sports figure, and it, and it had an impact on me when I was struggling living in Montreal, um, closeted playing hockey. So, so to know they were in the film eased it a bit, and um, Paul was very reassuring that my story would be told in a, you know, a, not in a negative way, and it wasn't, you know, like I was... I was reassured of all my fears going into it and, and it, I just felt comfortable. And I said, let's, let's go for it. Great, so then the movie starts. So Paul, can you talk a little bit maybe about the process, how long it took to film? You had multiple locations, you had multiple people. There were a lot of pieces to put together. Can you talk about that aspect a little bit? Um, yeah, um, I, all told it's five or six years from start of the research to finishing the film. Um, and about a three-year period of filming. Um, partly, um, we were following, like Anastasia was still actively skating when we started to film. And so that was part of the story um, where her skating would take her. Um, so, you know, when you're following people, you don't always control the, the schedule but so it, it yeah it, it took a long it took a long time I filmed in let's see Calgary Sudbury Toronto Montreal Asheville North Carolina and New York City so um, it took me to a lot of places um, putting the film together I guess editing it I worked with a brilliant editor named Dominique Sicot um, we, it was interesting that um, there was a lot of similarities in the stories. Um, and so when you're working, this is, I'm getting a little technical, but, but when you're working at editing a story with three different people who are like have three, like you all occupy the same amount of time and space in, in, in the film, uh, then you kind of have to decide uh, what part of each story that you're going to put so it doesn't become repetitive, actually. Um, so that was fascinating to do. Um, it, it was a labor of love editing this film. Um, and uh, uh, I had to explain to my editor because it was the first time that we worked together. Uh, I would cry so much in the edit suite. I say like, I. <laughs> I'm not your typical audience. <laughs> Just don't you know, like I I react to this stuff so strongly. Like so yeah. Um so yeah, that's um that's a lot of work. But uh I guess to end, I, I like to people have asked me like, oh, you must be so happy that it's done. I say, no, <laughs> I want it to go on forever. <laughs> Don't let it stop. <laughs> it's such a beautiful film and I will share my experience viewing it in a few minutes, but still while the process of filming took place uh, yeah. for the athletes, what was it like to have cameras follow you around? Were you scared that how your story was going to be portrayed and how did it impact your personal life at the time, David? Ooh. Uh, I was all of those. I was definitely scared and terrified and petrified <laughs> and um, up until the day that we saw it because I, like I said, let everything go in that, in that movie and, or in that film. And uh, like Paul said, like, who knows what, what he's going to put in there because there was moments where I was like, you know, telling... <laughs> You know, you can keep that stuff locked up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just like revealing the deepest parts of yourself. So um, it definitely affected my personal relationships um, within my community and in my family. And it's just also recent, right? It just came out and my mom just saw it. So um, she was obviously in the in the film as well and had her own reservations and her own thoughts about it too. But I do want to share is that um, she did have a big pivot and um, after she did watch the movie because you know I I I asked her I said hey have you have you seen the movie and 
she said, yeah. I said, oh, I was just so excited. She figured out how to work the electronics, like <laughs> properly and to watch it in the States. Um, and I said, how do you feel? And she, she wasn't, um, ex ex she was happy with obviously the movie, but she wasn't necessarily happy with her response, meaning that she had wished she was on the other side since the very beginning. We're gonna dig into that a little bit more <laughs> too as we get to the post reaction of the film. Uh, Brock, your experience sort of as it happened, what were your thoughts as you were being followed around the cameras? Um, it was, at that point I was doing a lot of media. So it, it had become kind of second nature and, and I think I was a bit of a diva at times. And um, <laughs> not not a diva, Paul, but I, I had to make sure I was, you know, powdered and-, and Yes, there was the powder, I remember that. I, I had to make yeah. sure- my got, makeup was not done. his own and, powder. I didn't supply the powder. No, I, I had to make sure my makeup was done and I looked <laughs> the way I wanted to look and everything else. Um, I think the most challenging part for me was when we filmed in Sudbury, we, we had about 20 or 30 minor hockey players that I worked with, and they weren't used to the whole hurry up and wait that happens in filmmaking. So they would start complaining to me. Yeah. And I'm trying to stay focused on this interview I'm about to do on the ice or this other scene I have to do and everything else. And now I'm babysitting 30 children at the same time. And, and I was like, I think I got to a point where I just looked at a bunch of them. And I said, would you just shut up and sit there? Like, just sit there, just be quiet. And I'm like, or go home, your choice, like pick. Um, and then they went, sorry, Brock. But um, I think for me, that was the most challenging part. Um, when we filmed at Woody's in the bar, um, it was difficult to stay sober because they kept giving us free drink tickets. And then we're sitting in the corner and people would just come by and stare at us. And you're trying to stay in the moment, but also like the bar is still running on a busy, like Sunday nights are super busy. And I think it might've been a long weekend. So like yeah, it was yeah. packed and people are just staring at us and you're trying to stay engaged in a conversation and everyone's watching you. And so that was interesting. <laughs> Anastasia. Well, I had that thought. I was like, Brock got to go to a bar? Like, <laughs> I was in a hot tub for three hours <laughs> having a heat, heat stroke. Uh, no, it was awesome. Um, I had done quite a bit of media in and around Sochi. Um, and so it did feel a little bit like second nature. But I had so much trust in Paul Emile that... Uh, you know, I kind of was like, let go and let God, like, this is my story, I, I trust in you. Um, but was, what was really cool, and I actually wanted to ask you, how many hours did you actually shoot? Like, editing that, going back just one um, second. I can't remember exactly, but I think between 40 and 50 hours. Yeah, like, yeah. like this was like two or three years of him checking up on us. So, I mean, I am so thankful for how you told my story. Like, truly, you put a smile on my heart. But even more than that, like, it was my story, of course, of, you know, accepting myself and coming out and whatnot. But, like, I saw myself grow up in the film because it was two or three years. And you captured when I was, you know, I still have a bum knee, but, like, you captured the most raw, real moments of me figuring out that I was retiring. So it just meant so much to me. And, Again, like it was like they became family. They check up every six or seven months and it was like, oh, okay, yeah, this is the new adventure that we're going on. So it, it was just a phenomenal experience. But I, I did wish that I had a bar scene. I'm actually way, way funnier in real life than that film. That's what I looked at. I was like, God, I seem very like stoic and serious. I'm not this serious, but- Three drinks so all night. Yeah, well, I wasn't invited. <laughs> Although there uh, was so that scene with uh, Kaylee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kay yeah. She, was, she made the movie. Yeah, <laughs> questionable shoe choices. That yeah. I That's like, totally get, the get the biggest. Yeah, one. she's one of Canada's funniest Olympians. I will say that. Uh, great. So you now all of a sudden, the film is starting to premiere. And I was lucky enough to be able to see it at its original premiere at Doxa in Vancouver. And I have to say, I was absolutely blown away by the film. It was emotional. I might cry when I talk about it. <laughs> I can relate so much to all of your stories. And it was so inspiring. And there were, there were light and shade in the movie too. It's not all tears, but there are some really beautiful 
personal moments and some really beautiful, funny moments. And so there's, it's a whole gamut of emotional experience when you're doing this. And so uh, when you first saw the film, when you first see your story come to life, what, what was that moment like for you, Rock? Well, we actually, Anastasia and I saw it together. We were at, uh, we went to the NFB uh, location in Toronto and watched it with Paul and, and uh, a couple of the production, like the producers. And um, it was emotional. It was emotional on a number of levels. It was um, not just seeing my story, but seeing other people's stories. Like I, I felt David's story. Um, I felt goosebumps knowing that Anastasia stood on that line and, and, and even to the point where she spoke about, um, you know, her personal best improving after she came out and, and I would be talking at like to sports teams or schools or corporates and they'd be like, what do you wish you had done? And I say all the time, I wish I'd come out earlier in my life because I think I, I would have, I had a support system and a network that I would have went further in the game. And I don't think the game got all of me. And hearing that just was so relatable that, yeah, that would have happened just seeing it in somebody else. And, and, you know, I hear my story over and over because I tell it a lot, but um, to see all of them come together. And like Paul said earlier about the similarities and, and some differences, it just, it was, it was a whirlwind of emotions. It was, you know, you, you wanted to cry because you felt everyone else's and it's so relatable to your own, but you also felt a sense of joy and pride that you got to share this moment with these other incredible people. It's beautiful. Anastasia. So with Brock, I cried. And again, I just, I appreciated so much how well-rounded every single story was presented. Like I just felt as though there was so much personal growth in everyone's story and you paid attention to detail and the intimate details and the, just the vulnerability of everyone's story. And, and you know, the high school, it, I, oh, I cried. I'm like, I, I, the two most vulnerable moments of my entire life were coming out of the closet and then figuring out that it was my time to hang up my skates and your ability to tell that story. Um, I mean, I'm so proud of this film. I will show it to my grandkids. If, you know, so that's, that's all I can say. I'm just uh, so grateful and uh, honored to have been included in it. David. Uh, uh, all of that. I, when I saw it, I just, uh, I knew it, it was interesting because if I put myself back into that place now, I honestly thought that this was going to be an irrelevant conversation by the time it came out because, <laughs> you know, you did ask me like quite after I retired, the process had started. So that was early like 2013, 14, around that, around then, right? Um, so by the time that we actually sat down and the whole thing got wrapped up, um, I, I was astonished that we were still kind of in the same place in reality. Uh, so just having that just still lay on your shoulders, knowing that you just kind of gave your everything and the pendulum hadn't really swung at all. Um, that was, that was a mix of emotions because it was like, yay, this is so amazing. This film is coming out and I get to share it with all these amazing people and all of our stories were so similar. Like, oh my God, imagine me in the movie crying, watching it was even worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it just goes to, to show what type of um, um, grit and courage it takes to do this individually as athletes and on your own um, because the response that I've, I've gone it's just not from athletes it's from maybe not as like professional lead athletes but it might just be like oh they hadn't had the chance to tell their mom this or whatever so just sitting back and watching it it was just like 
so overwhelming on so many levels and I actually saw it on the big screen in Vancouver so that was even crazier I was like maybe I should have gotten the powder Brock was talking about (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Paul for you uh, it's your film finally getting to see it released what was that experience like for you Um, well thanks for all the (laughs) kind things you're saying Um, as a filmmaker for me I have strengths and weaknesses uh, for sure. But I think one of my strengths is uh, is that I think I get people. And um, so the fact that you all trusted me, um, but also showing it to you for me was nerve wracking because what if, you know, it's not really, you know, what if I get something wrong, like really wrong? I didn't think so, but, but yeah, so thank you. And showing it around uh, has been really uh, wonderful. Uh, it's interesting that, um, you know, it got quite a bit of press, some press here in Vancouver, but when, when it screened last December in uh, Montreal, the amount of press was crazy. Like I was, It seems for some reason, and I'm not quite sure why it resonated so much in Quebec, possibly because of David, who is from, you know, played in Montreal Impact. Um, But like it was in La Presse, in the Journal de Montréal, uh, and who typically do not, are not interested in National Film Board films. You know, it was the topic that was interesting. and, um, you know, TVA, Radio Canada, and on and on. Um, and then when I screened it in Montreal, there were, you know, there's always these moments. Um, there's a mother who came to me at the screening um, with her teenage boy who had been bullied uh, in sports. Um, and it was a very, you know, she was very emotional about, about the film. And, you know, I thought, Ugh. Yeah, you know, like, never mind all the media stuff that I've done. Like, (laughs) this is why I'm doing it, right? For these little moments, you know? Um, Yeah, so, I mean, I've had, fortunately, I was able to show it around before before the pandemic, you know? So hopefully many more people will see it. That's a good segue into my next question, because it's been now available for a little while, but now publicly really for the first time on CBC Jam where people can download it or stream it for free, really get to see it. Uh, What has, for each of the athletes, what has it been like to share your stories publicly and what has the reaction been like, Anastasia, Anastasia? Uh, I mean, the unfortunate thing is that we were gonna have a big screening in Toronto and then of course COVID hit. So I, I feel like you know, once we're over this, uh, I hope that we can reschedule that. Um, I, of course, work for CBC and all of my colleagues. It's on CBC Gen, but yeah, all of my colleagues were excited and, and we were going to have a big party. Um, a lot of people have seen it on CBC Gen, and I'm always just so humbled um, with people reaching out or athletes reaching out. Um, that are in the closet or struggling to come out um, and to accept themselves or to reconcile what that part of their identity means with being an athlete. Um, So I'm always incredibly humbled by that. And it's in some respects, like I, it almost kind of, I don't even know how to describe it. I host a podcast and I'm not being very eloquent, but um, like it almost takes me aback because when I came out publicly, like I wasn't doing it for some big, you know, media gesture. I wasn't doing it for that, that, you know, media fame, anything. I don't even know how to describe that. It's just, I'm always so taken aback and humbled with, with how people resonate um, with the story and, and that they trust me to share theirs. And of course, this film has just continued so many of those conversations and interactions. And I just feel so um lucky to be in this privileged position and uh, again i think i said it in the film it's weird to say that you're proud of yourself like i i hope i'm not a cocky individual but i'm 
I'm proud of this film and I'm proud of my story. And if I can continue to hopefully evolve that story and help others to be proud of themselves, then I mean, that's a roundabout way, way for saying it's been received very well. And uh, again, just so, so, so grateful for Paul O'Neill and, and how he told all of our stories. It doesn't come off as cocky at all. I think it's a beautiful story and it's, it's worth sharing. Uh, David. Uh, it, for me, it, it's been quite uh, interesting. I wish that I could say that it's been great because like when something gets released, you want to get really excited about it, right? And be like, yeah, this is amazing. But the content within it, again, isn't that type of feeling. So it's, it's been this, um, I, I, I totally agree with you, Anastasia, like this being very proud of being able to even do this. You have to at some point lay in your bed at night and just be like, oh my God, this was not easy. And that's okay because the, the proof is in the put pudding, meaning like there is no representation of us in our sports or we didn't have those people to look up to. We didn't have role models to say, this is how you do it. So everything that we've done has come from within and we just happened to do it in different places of the world relatively around the same time. So um, just personally saying, when you say that, just know that, that that is for real, like, and you should be proud of yourself. Um, and we all should, uh, because just look around. It's, it's not, we are not the normal. Um, so with that said, like people have, every time someone says that they watched it, I go, oh, what was your experience? Because everyone has such a different experience watching it. Um, and I think that really depends on their own personal experience with being gay and maybe coming out to their own families and their own relationship with this and uh, their, their reality and, and their families and wherever it is. So I think people are, some people are like very emotional. Like I talked to some people and they said it was really hard to watch. Like moments where you're just like broken down. I almost have to like, and, and I go, well, yeah. I, sometimes the harder things to look at are some of the most important things that we have to witness. So just continuing to hold space for people after they witness it, because it's not like you do this film and you're like, see you later. You know, I did my, 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 my part. It's following up on emails. It's understanding other people's perspective and experiences. So it, I feel like since I watched it for the first time, it's actually just begun. Brock, for you, what's your experience been like? It's, I think it was really interesting for me. Um, at that point, like I was sharing a lot and, and I do share a lot. And, and when I first came out, I wrote an article like hoping to, you know, almost to take my story back because it was my sexuality was used against me in my sport and it was to empower myself and maybe empower a few people. And it became more than that. And I ended up in a National Film Board documentary film with two incredible people by an incredible person. So I'm very fortunate. Um, my, my biggest worry through it all is um, I come, my parents are incredibly supportive and loving, but they're very private people. And I'm always so apprehensive. Like I'll say things in the media and my mom will be like, well, why'd you say that like that? And, and I've had articles come out. Like I remember when I first came out, there was an article on the front page of the local newspaper that said, um, and the title was in big block letters, I wanted to kill myself every day. And it was a picture of me. And my mother saw that in the grocery store. So um, I've, I've always been worried about what they think and, and not because like their opinion, like my opinion of what I do matters to me more than anyone else's, but I want to be conscientious of them. And so I went with my mom to see it the first time and, and uh, having her, you know, like seeing, seeing, you know, her well up and, 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 seeing how proud of it she was, was huge. And then my father watched it on Gem and, and he felt that his only critique, Paul, was that he felt like the guy with the big head, meaning himself, should have been in the film more. Uh, and, 
and I actually told him that it was too hard for you to configure his head into the screen, so <laughs> that it would have been impossible. Um, but your father's a lovely man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know their opinion and how they see it, because I, I talk a lot of, about dark things, and that was that's always been a lot of my fear and concern is protecting them through it and um, seeing how happy they were with it and and how much they enjoyed it and how much people in my life enjoyed it m means the world. All of it, I just, I'm going to keep saying it over and over again. I really enjoyed it. I relate to all of the stories so much. And there were so many powerful moments for each of you within the film. And so David, I'd like to start with you. When you are in the school, uh, when you go back to your high school and you're sitting in this hallway and you have this moment where you break down in the staircase, where you have all of this sort of introspection about being bullied and bullying other people and this whole moment, it's so emotional, it's so vulnerable, it's so raw and I think will probably be one of the defining moments for me of the entire film. Um, can you talk about that experience and then again a little bit more about uh, the coming out story with your mother and how she reacted at the time and sort of you touched on it a little bit, how she's evolved now. Yeah. Uh, that hall scene was like, oh my God, but can we not even talk about it right now? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just, it just happened. And I think that we all have that within us, like that, you know, that we've been carrying around forever that just, I needed to like all those days that I've walked and you know, I'm sure you guys have too in your halls and just not allowed to be yourself. And it was just so surreal with everyone there with the cameras and the whole story and everything that was happening. And it just, that whole thing went boom. Um, it just was too overwhelming for me. And it just all released. And then there was just a flood of memories that came back to me. Um, that had been buried and i think that that just got released in the most raw authentic way that i could express it um and moving from there it was like it was like this whole process i think it's been probably for all of us like seeing yourself there going back to those places revisiting oh my god paul what are you a therapist do i need to pay you <laughs> Can I interject on the uh, <laughs> high school? <laughs> uh, uh, so we were filming and, uh, you know, David's telling his story and, uh, and the, the big emotional scene, actually, we lost David. Like we were just kind of regrouping and pushing around some equipment and then say, where's David? And then Nancy, researcher and uh, uh -huh. traveling with us, we all love Nancy. Nancy, um, went around looking for David and she found him on those stairs uh, crying. So thank you for trusting me. That was an amazing um, amount of trust that you put in me when I arrived there with the camera and started talking to you. And I, I said, can I film you? You said, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That looked like to watch it almost like an incredibly therapeutic moment. Mm -hmm. or you like that that's what I felt watching and, and it was like one of those scenes where I went holy you know like it, it just like that almost like breaking aha whatever you want to call it moment it was powerful yeah. it was extremely powerful and I like I said it's going to be one of the moments that sort of <laughs> resonates with me the most from the film that I will hold with me for a long long time um, and David, just quickly, your mother and your experience, sort of uh, how, how her perspective has changed throughout this process. Yeah, like, uh, I, I, my mom, for me, is like the star. <laughs> I'm like, anything that she says is like the truth. And I kind of lived with that my whole life. And uh, I think as you get older and you start to become more of yourself and develop your own beliefs um, and take distance, uh, I think it's important, especially if you come from a place and a family that does not accept who you are to start to create your own beliefs in yourself and your own communities and stuff like that. So this has been a whole process for my mom from the very beginning until where we are now. Uh, and from the very beginning in the, in the film, it's, it's like basically she came to Vancouver 
uh, for a two week stay for a couple games. And I told her when she got there, you know, and then she basically said to me, you're, you, no, you're not. <laughs> I was like, uh, yeah, I am. So from that moment, and it was even before that moment, from that moment to now, she has changed like so much. And I was like, it took a freaking film to do this. Like <laughs> it's just not telling you is enough. But to be honest, like having that phone call with my mom, I almost thought that I like had really, we have gone into a different paradigm like now because like she really has, like she gets it. She saw herself and she's like, I, she said to me, I really wish that like I wasn't someone that always went with like the groups, you know, I wish I was had the courage to do and support you from the very beginning. That's what she, that's what she really came around and said. And to me, I was just like, so many emotions like i'm happy but yeah i but. didn't know this wow <laughs> yeah so yeah the film continues to have an impact today which is mm. incredible uh anastasia for you um being the only female sort of portrayed in this film i was wondering if you could offer a gendered perspective a little bit of what it's like to be a female athlete in this sort of macho dominated culture in an individual sport and your experience as a lesbian and being sort of one of the foremost recognizable publicly figures, I suppose, now in Canada as a female athlete? Um, I wrestle with it a little bit because I think there are uh, preconceptions or stereotypes that a lot of female athletes are gay. And if you're straight, it's like, oh, well, especially on a team sport, if you're the, you know, everyone just assumes that you're gay. And of course, I, I don't play on a team sports sport. I never did, but I have friends that are straight on team sports and they're kind of like, oh, I'm never going to meet a guy because everyone just assumes I'm gay. Um, but speed skating was very gender neutral. Uh, I, I didn't really know any other athletes in, in the sport that were out. Um, certainly if they were gay, they weren't talking about it. And... I just hope that this can kind of further the conversation around uh, stigma, you know, like if we look at our big four sports and you do the math, like, give me a break. You don't think there's a gay NFL boy or NHL or NBA or, you know, MLB, like it's just ridiculous. Um, but for female sports, you, you kind of assume that everyone's gay, which is ridiculous. And, um, you know, I, I really want to, you know, kind of hopefully, change that narrative and, and make it sport by sport and say, yeah, if you're a female figure skater, like that would be horrifically lonely and confusing and, and anxiety ridden because we put people into boxes, you know, and, and we gender police them and we police them with our language. And so I struggled because I felt like I had no one to turn to and I had no one to look up to. And I really struggled with, you know, okay, yeah, Glee is on TV or Will and Grace, but in my day-to-day -day life, I just didn't know how I can reconcile this part of my identity with this part of my identity. Um, but certainly I, I do think that it kind of devalues the struggles of female athletes when we kind of flippantly go, oh, it's completely different. Certainly I, I, I'm here to say, yeah, in some team atmospheres, it is way more accepting, but it's not easy. And, um, you know, Brock, when you said, oh, my, my, you know, I'm always very cognizant of what my parents see me say or, you know, what they read. And I've struggled, of course, as everyone has with their mental health. Um, and it's hard on my parents too, to hear that, like, you know, I, I thought about ending my own life. Like that's really, really friggin' hard for a parent to hear, but I'm not going to shut up about it until we see that kids that are LGBTQ youth, I mean, disproportionate homeless rates and suicide rates. And so, yes, you know, this is a very like scattered answer. I apologize, but I'm not going to shut up and, 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 you know, just skate like, or just broadcast. I need to talk, talk about my story. And I hope that it, it gives power to, you know, female athletes, whether you're a hockey player or a soccer player, or you're, you're a rhythmic gymnastic or a figure skater. Yeah. There's two things that really, so go ahead, Paul. Sorry. No, I just want to say briefly, I got so many times when I was interviewed about this film, it's like, isn't it harder for men than women, uh, gay men than lesbian? Isn't it harder in team sports and individual? It's like, I don't know how to quantify human suffering. Yeah. 
you know, <laughs> yeah, watch yeah. my film, right? It, everyone has a different experience, and I don't think it's fair to say those things. I mean, with, you know, that's what I want to say about that. That's a really good point. And for me, two things that really stuck out from what you were saying, Anastasia, is there's maybe this perception that a lot of female athletes are gay, but yet there are not a lot of gay athletes who are female speaking out publicly about their own experience. Yeah. And so um, that's troubling. I mean, it, people should be able to talk about their own experiences regardless of what they are. And so thank you for being able to do that. I know it's not easy. And secondly, just to point out also what you did in Sochi, I think was so uh, powerful and I'm so grateful. That's gonna make me cry a little bit for what you did. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We, we've been Brock. doing lots of yoga. Yeah. So we've been, lots of uh, yoga Brock, for you, something that really stuck out for me in the film is one, your honesty about uh, your mental health, your substance, your turning to different substances to deal with your mental health. Uh, so I'd like you to maybe talk about that aspect a little bit, how that's been to talk about publicly. And then secondly, also the work that you do with young people, I think is really impressive as, as, a, as a speaker and a motivational speaker and a coach and working with the younger generation to really demystify these stigmas that exist. Uh, what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, I think sharing and, and sharing my mental health struggles through it, I think is important. Um, like Anastasia said, until it's, you know, there are not any more disproportionate levels of suicide attempts and suicides by queer youth, um, until there's true equality within sport culture, until we can break down these barriers of hypermasculinity within sport culture, which also lead to the opposite stereotypes for women, because of the patriarchy and of you know the assumption that you have to be hyper masculine to play sport therefore as female you must be a lesbian and it's all kind of uh for lack of better wording bullshit um and and it's not fair and and, and it's um something that really irks me because it leads to a lot of queer people not playing sports um on both sides because they don't want to, or parents not putting their, I, I've had people come to me with stories, parents won't put them into like hockey because they don't want their daughters to be lesbians. And, and that idea to me is so absurd that a sport is going to turn your child queer. And if your child's queer, they're queer. Like, there is, like the sport isn't going to do anything about it. And, and if they're straight, they're straight. And, and you know, I, I'd say for all of us in sport, it probably would have been a lot easier to be straight. So for us to be um, queer within it is telling, you know, like it, there, it's not a choice. Um, I think I share my struggles because I know other people are struggling. And I think I share my abuse and addiction because I think a lot of people numb, especially within the queer community. And, and, you know, there's disproportionate rates of drugs and alcohol. I mean, our, a lot of our community was founded um, in bar scenes, you know, like uh, where we could hide and be ourselves and uh, without fear. So th there is a lot of alcoholism. There is a lot of drug addiction. Um, I, gone, I went to a queer youth event where I was speaking and it's about 300 LGBTQ plus youth. And, and uh, when I got there, there was 50 to 100 teenagers outside smoking cigarettes at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, I went in, I was sitting with somebody who was studying community health. They were doing a master's and they're there to sit in on my talk. And this woman looked at me and she said, look around the room. She said, at least 80% of these kids would be deemed obese by, you know, like society standards or Canada health standards, whatever it is. And if they're numbing with food and they're numbing with cigarettes, they're probably numbing with drugs, alcohol, and sex. And they're not dealing with their own struggles. So to me, sharing my struggles and, and how I've, you know, empowered myself to, 
you know, persevere through them. And, and that comes with a lot of privilege of having the ability to go to therapy and do different things that not a lot of people have, which is also why I put it out there. So they at least have a resource to me and I can kind of help them and the best I can, and also hopefully find them help in their areas. Um, that's why I share what I share. And because I know it's people in sports, numb a great deal. Um, working with youth and, and whatnot, um, when I first shared my story, the first day I received over 10,000 messages. Uh, it was uh, the most overwhelming day of my life. And I sat up until six in the morning answering every single one. And um, I saw how much people were struggling and it broke my heart. And it's been my life mission now to try and stop that. I don't want anyone to feel the way I felt. I don't want anyone to feel the way we felt. And if I can help a kid, you know, and, or help several kids or shift cultures within, you know, influential sports cultures like hockey culture in Canada or different things that may, you know, like Paul said, who may be the bullies. If, if I can create a shift there and humanize it for them, and, and use my story as a humanizing aspect. And I think we're seeing that in culture right now through the Black Lives Matter movement where, you know, humanizing struggle and oppression will, will lead to people wanting to educate themselves to shift. So to me, being out there and being visible and, and trying to break down every door wall I have to, to get into more places, to speak at more places, just, is what I have to do. And there's nothing else in my mind but that. Because if it saves one kid, if a few less kids are numbing with substances, then it, it's worth it. If one kid's life is saved, it's worth it. I am so incredibly grateful to all of you. All three of you are role models and Paul for even a, being able to, to make these stories come to life to, in a way that we can all see them. All four of you have done so much to heal trauma within our community. and beyond our own community, to the people in our lives, and to people we don't even know. So my gratitude to all of you is very profound. We only have about five minutes left. Uh, so I just want to ask, uh, now that the movie's been out for a while, you have had these sort of long life journeys, like you were saying before, Anastasia, it's been a long time to see yourself those years ago and, and the sort of journey that you've been on. How do you think, how far have we come? in professional sports and what work still needs to be done? What's changed? What still needs to be accomplished, Anastasia? In pro sports, I don't think we've gone very far at all. Um, I can speak about that. I can speak about amateur and Olympic sports, high performance sport. I think we've done a really good job, to be honest. Um, I mean, we're not perfect, but from 2014, especially up in Canada, I think that our Canadian Olympic Committee is a leader uh, on the world stage. Um, they have implemented uh, a number of programs that reach a bunch of kids and engage the high performance community to have difficult conversations. Again, we are not perfect and there's still a long ways to go, but from 2014, I think people are more, people are just more woke, you know, like I think they're, they're uh, more comfortable and willing to have conversations about orientation and gender identity. Whereas even six years ago, people fumbled language or they were so scared of offending that they didn't even have the conversation. And of course that is still an issue. And, you know, that's why we speak to, to allies and allyship and, you know, what you can do to make the situation better. But certainly in high performance sport, um, I think we, we have come uh, a long way. I, I would challenge the IOC with rule 50 um, in regards to athlete voices and, and protests at the Olympics. I think that that needs to change. I think the IOC will find themselves on the wrong side of history if they don't change, to be honest. Um, because again, I mean, we just finished pride and it would have been lovely to have had a parade and sit on a patio and you know have a celebratory drink. But because of COVID, we're having these really difficult conversations with ourselves and we're redefining what we have defined as a little box of diversity. And we're trying to expand that box. And that includes conversations in sport, at the Olympic level, at the high performance level, at the grassroots level. So the big four, yeah, we need, we need men to come out. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's not a new thought, but representation is incredibly powerful. And if you can see it, you can believe it. And uh, I do believe that the grassroots are probably, you know, doing things to change significantly, but NFL, okay, well, Brock is saying no, but uh, I, I have to believe in the next generation or it's going to be better than our generation. But at the big four, NFL, NHL, NBA, MLB, we need to do better. I mean, and, and we, need, we need men to come out to really start uh, changing this conversation. Brock is shaking his hand, head. Brock, go. Floor is yours, Brock. I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. I believe that, and, and I agree everything with what you're saying in terms of like the, you know, C COC has done a wonderful job and, and in Olympic sports, I think we, we've, you know, done a much better job in certain countries. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm yeah. speaking from a Canadian point of yeah, view. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of, uh, I'm going to put this to, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of women's sport. I have talked to women in like the professional hockey world who, uh, even trans women and trans men in that side of it who have had wonderful experiences. Um, on the men's side, I believe that 99% of the things that happen are performative in nature. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, having a pride night isn't, is, is the equivalent of putting a black square on your Instagram grid and thinking you have solved racism. Um, visibility is nice, but if you're not shifting your culture within the locker rooms, which start at the age of seven and you have people gatekeeping the culture, um, at every level of the sport and not allowing the shifts to happen. Um, there's still homophobia run, running rampant in locker rooms at every level of every major male team sport. Um, Ian Desmond, a professional baseball player, is sitting out because of the racism, the sexism, and the homophobia that exists in locker rooms in Major League Baseball. Um, I know for a fact it happens in hockey. It's happening in the others as well. And that trickle down effect yeah, is present everywhere and um, I'm tired of seeing groups and teams march in prides and do things without actually shifting their culture because what they're doing is they're shifting uh, the reality in men's team sports is it's business and and when you look at walking in prides and whatnot it's it's their corporate people who are walking in prides um, corporate culture is very different than sport culture and they haven't, they, they take credit for shifting. They'll go, look what we're doing with our employees. And I'm like, those employees have never engaged with one of your athletes. Not once, not ever, and may never meet them just in passing until they shift that side of the sport, the actual sport culture, then the rest is performative in nature or just corporate culture until minor sports actually implements programs that humanize people's struggles and then use educators who are qualified in the fields to put programs together to follow up to educate these kids at grassroots level nothing will change you can have all the task force you can have all the committees you want in the world it's going to be the same people talking about the same things over and over and it's repetitive and it's been going on for as long as I've been out and longer and nothing has changed. And homophobia exists at every level of the sport, of male team sport culture. That really resonates uh, what both of you are saying, but I'll give the final word to David on this question. Uh, anything you wanna add, final thoughts about how, how where, where we've come, where we're going. Uh, yeah, I think that both of what you guys said is so good. Jeez, you guys are so smart and have done your <laughs> homework and have been actively listening and engaging. So that's really um, awesome to see. I personally feel that it's more of a spiral uh, evolutionary growth and more of a linear kind of growth. So kind of 
being able to see how it should look uh, in the future is definitely important. And knowing how to get there is also super, super important. And it's not going to happen overnight. So it's going to be exactly what Brock was saying. It's just the little sprinkle here, a little sprinkle there, grassroot here, grassroot there. But it also needs to change on the other spectrum as well, like in terms of the laws and regulations and um, the governing bodies of sports as well. So I think that's also important. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's happening uh, slower, I think, than any of us ever could imagine, honestly, because back in 2010, 11, and 12, when I came out, I honestly thought that it was going to be like, this is the time, because everywhere else in culture, in corporate culture, people were starting to come out, like, it's okay to be gay and a designer, like, you're actually celebra uh, celebrated and, you know, and society now so to have that such a stark difference in professional sports still there's obviously a problem um so we have to figure out what that problem is and, and then and then help people uh in whatever situations they are give them that support that they need to find their voices and um have the courage to say hey listen i want nothing more than to be my truest authentic self beyond also being the best hockey player or soccer player or whatever because right now you can't have both so we need to make it we need to make space for them uh to have the ability to find their voices and find their courage and find whatever they need their resources to build them up and, and to allow them to, to voice their most authentic selves, whatever that is. You. Uh, Paul, you have done such a great job of creating a platform for all of these discussions. How do we continue the discussion and what's the future for you? When do we get to see more movies like this coming from you? Um, well, I mean, after listening to these three amazing athletes talk about the I mean, I, I really am not in that world, so I, I, I defer to their, what they're seeing, and I'm very grateful for the work that they're doing. Um, and in my, my own, I mean, my wish for the film is, I know that the NFB, the National Film Board, is going to promote it heavily within the school system. So um, eventually, I, I'm really, pleased about that and and I'm hoping also that coaches minor hockey coaches will show this film to to their kids you know like to start from really the grassroots I mean I I think it it could be a good way to start a conversation if you're a, a coach and you're not you know you're not really that comfortable talking about sexuality to your 13 year old you know 13 year olds on your hockey team so I think I'm hoping that the film can be used that way. And in terms of what's next for me in filmmaking, um, well, I just uh, moved last year to Vancouver from Halifax. So I'm now officially bi-coastal and uh, <laughs> very happy to be in Vancouver. Um, and also I started a new job uh, working for uh, Radio-Canada, a show called Enquête which is in investigative journalism, which brings me closer to documentary. It's very, it's really, I'm doing documentary in my day job now. So, you know, I'm kind of living the dream. I'm very happy about that. Um, in terms of my personal projects, I just yesterday started reading a book that <laughs> has got me going, hmm. So, can't tell you what it's about though. <laughs> well, so, I so very much look forward to seeing what comes out of your your brain next whatever your your next documentary is sign me up I will be there first in line mm -hmm. thank you to all four of you so much Paul Emile Dantremo, Anastasia Busis, Brock McGillis and David Testo Standing on the Line is now available for streaming on CBC Gem thank you again all of you so very much my grateful my gratitude to all of you you are all role models and i am so grateful to have this conversation with you today thank you